on this. And we'll start off with just uh, aspects of that today. So this is a world map generated by the World Economic Forum, and it is a world map about sports event facilities, um, where the different colors depict in blue where most sports event facilities that can host, if I remember correctly, more than 20,000 spectators down to perhaps the darker red ones where there are less of those facilities. Now, the purpose of the slide is not to talk about the size of facilities or where they're distributed, but to, to indicate that in order for athletes in a particular sport to compete, the uh, issues relate nowadays in modern times to an increasing reality that travel is an integral part of this. Athletes that have uh, uh, entered and will compete this evening probably arrived yesterday, the day before, and a few days before that, maybe, from different parts of the world. It's very different to decades ago, 40, 50 years ago, where the uh, teams traveled often by ship over many weeks uh, from Southampton to Perth to go and play a cricket game. And that is very different to nowadays where there's a direct flight from London to Perth recently introduced. So there's rapid transfer and, uh, to competitions, and these competitions can last from sometimes hours, but mostly days to weeks or sometimes even months. So what I'd like to do today is to take a first uh, stab at what are the challenges? What are the threats uh, when an athlete is required to travel extensively, rapidly, multiple times in a year to different parts of the world to train and compete. I'm going to break this up today into discussing aspects of travel fatigue. That will be a very short uh, slide. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the physiological changes that occur, physiological changes that are related to travel, uh, um, which we know now as the jet lag disorder. And I'm going to speak about some frontiers around, not new frontiers around that. I'm going to touch on one or two aspects around illness risk, mostly illness risk associated with actual traveling, being in an airplane. And uh, I'm going to not discuss the risks of illness when you've arrived and the strategies to minimize that risk. And I'm going to leave that for Sunday. So please, uh, that, don't expect that to be covered this afternoon. During my presentation, I've got slides that uh, uh, focus on what I would consider new frontiers in this area and other slides that I have put together that are some clinical pearls for those that are clinicians. And for those clinical pearls, I'm going to have to go through some of those slides fairly quickly because I would like to invite you once again to the workshop tomorrow morning where we can apply those. So, my slide on travel fatigue. Travel fatigue is, a, is really a common phenomena. It's a, uh, it's a real phenomena, and it's associated with fatigue and tiredness uh, with a variety of different vague symptoms that are as a result of any prolonged travel. And it could be a long-haul flight. There's a, always has a component of a fatigue, travel fatigue, but also overground travel. And uh, I want to point that out because in some instances teams still travel by bus, for instance, for three or four hours uh, to a destination. The variety of different factors that contribute to the development of uh, travel fatigue, and these are listed here, and again, we can explore those in, in a workshop again tomorrow, but essentially there's a, a period of often uh, immobilization within a single position. There's boredom and there are a variety of different strategies to combat boredom, boredom associated with, obviously, with long journeys. Sometimes uh, athletes in my part of the world have not traveled before um, for long durations, maybe the first time, and there's a lack of psychological preparation for any long trip. If the travel is um, over a time period, let's say leaving early in the morning on a bus trip or uh, leaving late afternoon and arriving 10 o'clock at night, this may result in an, a disturbance of sleep or sleep deprivation. And we've heard earlier today that is one of the risk factors that is even related to injuries. 
The other issue is the next two points, which are probably linked in some way. There's a confined space, even in a bus, uh, with a potential risk of illness transfer, and I'll talk to you about airplanes in, in a little bit later. And of course, exposure to artificial air, which could either be air conditioning or recirculated air. And here is probably the one last major point. It's frequently a time period where there's a limit to a, a limitation in the ability for an individual to regulate their own environment. Uh, if it's a bus ride, perhaps there are some facilities on board, but sometimes they're not. And nutrition, hydration, uh, bowel bladder uh, patterns and function become an issue, and it's a difficult to regulate. Just I had to, I was I had to go and visit the bathroom because I was drinking a lot of water because it's fairly hot here, and I had to interrupt. Uh, but I luckily could do that. I could slip out between Jill's talk and just talk and just use the bathroom. But sometimes on a bus it may not be that easy. So that's enough on travel fatigue, a very real phenomena that requires some planning and uh, has to be managed by a medical and other staff that are traveling with teams. So the next uh, little while, I'm going to discuss what is known as jet lag or jet lag disorder. And I'm going to give you just sort of a few in a nutshell uh, pointers. I am going to discuss one, of the, one or two of the new, new interesting frontiers in this, uh, certainly ones that are fascinating me and uh, perhaps are areas for, for the future. The first point perhaps is that the terminology jet lag disorder has been re removed from the DSM-5 um, publication and it's now encompassed in another classification, in fact you can see it over there, uh, the circadian rhythm sleep disorder. So it's one of a number of disorders that fall into that category. And under these disorders, it is now known as jet lag type. Um, and it's defined at the bottom here. It's uh, sleepiness and alertness that occurs at inappropriate times of the day relative to the local, uh, local time. So for those of you who've traveled yesterday, the day before, and I know that some of you have um, uh, re have traveled long distances, um, then you may very well experience these symptoms which are not what they should be for the local time. And that's essentially what the jet lag type is defined as. Okay, so what do we, probably this is information that most of you have a reasonably good knowledge of, in that it's important to understand that these, that your body is regulated uh, by uh, rhythms. These are internally generated um, and by definition they persist even in the absence of any time cues. So in solitary confinement in the dark there will still be biological rhythms. Perhaps not always appreciated. Maybe this is something that for some of you where this is not your primary area would not be uh, familiar with the fact that there are in fact many many rhythms within the body. Um, they've virtually control all aspects of the physiology. And this is often referred to as the so-called symphony, the orchestra of these oscillated, oscillate, oscillators. Um, there is a central, let's call it conductor or pacemaker, that is situated in a very specific part of the brain, which is the suprachiasmatic nuclei area, SCN area of the hypothalamus. And when there's a disturbance of this, the orchestra it's, and its order, we talk about a desynchronization, there's asynchrony. Sometimes we also talk about an external dyssynchrony and an internal dyssynchrony, and I'll speak about that in a moment. And when you're exposed to an environment which does not, um, or does change your external cues for this, and it doesn't always have to be travel, there is a so-called uh, condition nowadays known as social jet lag. Anybody heard of social de jet lag? Social, social je jet lag is often what young millennials are suffering from because they spend you know, very funny times of the day or night on exposing themselves to, to, to uh, light from your computer and screen and can also cause this desynchrony. That's social jet lag. So there are a variety of things that can give you this desynchronization. And then we talk about the phase of resynchronization, which is adaptation to these, to these cues.
All right, so we carry on with uh, jet, law, jet lag disorder in a nutshell. Um, any individual, and this is a theme that's going to develop, is that we all are in slightly different, we're not substantially different physiology because of our genetic makeup. And every one of our internal uh, so-called periodicity or endogenous periodicity, in other words, how these cycles work is different. And the average person's average human endogenous period is just over 24 hours, in fact. Uh, and it depends on a variety of different things. Obviously, your um, experience uh, with time cues, let's say light or blue light, uh, there's a male-female difference, and there's an ancestry difference, genetic difference. Now, in order for us to maintain a normal cycle, there are cues, and we know that the most important, and this is very very well documented is the light-dark cycle, exposure to normal light. Other times, uh, time cues, other things that can affect our internal rhythms are things like meals, what do we ingest, uh, exercise, uh, I spoke about social cues, um, and drugs. By drugs, we mean social drugs as much as perhaps medication. One of the common social drugs is, for instance, caffeine, and that can also affect the normal rhythms. So in broad terms, there's a continuum of peoples, um, let's call it endogenous periodicity, ranging from those that are the morning or di morning diurnal preference types, the so-called morning types, and then there's a spectrum uh, to the evening or evening, uh, evening preference types, so-called uh, larks for morning and owls. And they, maybe if I can ask you who in the audience considers themselves to be an early morning person primarily. All right. And obviously who is more an evening? There's going to be a third category, kind of a mixed category, so don't worry about it. So evening category or evening person. All right, the owls. And then I presume the rest of you are in the middle. And that's essentially uh, pretty much fairly normal for the population. So when do you know that you've got a so-called jet lag disorder or symptoms? And the first thing is that this is something that occurs and develops in most individuals um, in response to a significant amount of travel over time zones. But actually not all individuals. Uh, there's not good data on this, but about a third, 30% 30, 30 of people do not really have a significant uh, problem with adaptation to traveling across time zones. We also know that symptoms are more intense over the time zones crossed. They're worse when we're flying eastward versus westward in general, there are differences. And that we need a time to adapt to the new environment with the new uh, stimuli from external cues and the rough uh, guideline is one day for every time zone. And I'm sure this is not that a very new information for you. We also know, and I'm not going to review this in a lot of detail, that there is a decline in sports performance related to uh, a significant disruption of your normal synchronization. So this is clinical pool one. For those of you who are not that familiar with it, but I'm sure you are, these are the symptoms of so-called jet lag or jet lag syndrome, and they are non-specific. But what is important as team physicians is to make a distinction between this and early illness. And we'll discuss illness much, uh, in much more detail on Sunday. So let me uh, interject a little bit at this point from information probably that you've heard uh, before about um, the jet lag syndrome. The new frontier in uh, this is an understanding of the molecular biology of these circadian rhythms being a much, much more complex uh, regulation than we previously anticipated. So what is true is that there is a master pacemaker, but it's new information that this is actually consists of a number of different, um, uh, both uh, transcription uh, repressors and activators, which are related and regulated to different genes. And so that makes that central 
Zeitgeber, as in German, is not as easy to understand. It's a very complex. And there are a variety of different genes. This is just a depiction of some of them that will play a role. The second, uh, perhaps new frontier, is that there are a network of so-called local clocks and local uh, determinants uh, of rhythms and rhythm control in most peripheral cells and tissues. And the next slide on the right-hand side um, gives you an idea of that's what we would call the central master clock. And then in the periphery in various tissues, there are a variety of other endogenous uh, signalers. Uh, again, these are controlled by a variety of different genes. And in a, a situation we have traveled from Canada to uh, Doha, there would be a disruption between the external cues and the central clock. There would also be a disruption between the central clock and some of the peripheral uh, inherent rhythms. A next new frontier um, is at this stage not really known, but there is some emerging evidence that repeated circadian disruption um, and obviously also related in, as a consequence to that to impairment in sleep can contribute to the pathogenesis of a number of chronic diseases. And so the question about the long-term health of an athlete or perhaps the medical staff that has repeated exposures to international travel uh, with the disruption of this, uh, the circadian, both the central and all the peripheral uh, clocks and rhythms, uh, and its relationship to the development of chronic disease is something to be aware of and probably will emerge over a number of years um, as, a, as an additional risk factor. And some of these disruptions, uh, maybe you don't see it on the right-hand side, but you will be able to uh, get the reference for this. So the question is, this may be at this point novel or futuristic or uh, not really applicable to athletes, um, but what about jet lag, genetics, clock genes, and risk of illness, risk of injury, and performance in athletes? And this is a brand new area for investigation. Um, and it's based on the fact that we have spoken about individual differences. We ha have spoken about the clock genes. And what I have not mentioned, perhaps, or emphasized to date are the differences in those genes or polymorphisms in those genes. For instance, in the period three uh, gene, it's one of the core clock genes and has an important role to play in influencing various circadian uh, parameters. It's also a gene that's highly expressed in many tissues, skin, blood, epithelium, uh, salivary, secreting glands, etc. And the um, variations or polymorphisms in this gene are some of the determinants as to why some of you indicated that you are early morning people or uh, late night people. And so there are certain variations in uh, uh, the chronotype um, and the genes. And on Sunday, I will explore this a little bit further for you, for those of you interested in, in, in some early, early data to show that this may be related to illness risk and injury risk in traveling athletes. Just uh, flagging it at this point as a new frontier. So what about another third new frontier? Certainly something that I haven't really uh, thought about until very recently. I live in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, most conferences that I go to are in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, most of uh, my athletes that I work with travel either to Australia and New Zealand, who are our biggest friends in sport, and in, then they also travel north and south. So we're exposed not only to east-west travel, but also to north-south travel. And so here's the question. We always attributed the not feeling well, those symptoms uh, perhaps of jet lag, to travel fatigue when we travel north-south. But a recent uh, theoretical model that has been uh, postulated uh, 
with um, uh, an analysis of the large data points shows that one has to in fact consider perhaps that north-south travel is also associated with desynchronization. And here's the very obvious reason for that, potential reason for that, is that if I travel in the middle of uh, winter in South Africa, which will be, let's say, in December from here, to the UK, which will then be the middle of summer, I am traveling from an environment over here where there is a very sh much shorter time exposure to light compared to in the north, in the, U in, the, in, um, in the UK, or perhaps even more so up in Scandinavia, I will be exposed to a much greater amount of light. So I'm traveling really from a relatively dark environment to a relatively light environment. That would be my summer. On, the, on that slide in the right-hand side is a model where uh, adaptation time has been modeled, and I'll share the results on the next slide of that model. No modeling, it's a theoretical modeling of traveling from a summer in the north to a winter in the south across east and west. And essentially, and this is a very busy slide, and I'm not going to intend to try and explain it except for you to look at the patterns. Essentially, it has been modeled that it can take up to three days uh, for an oscillator with an average human endogenous period. This would be the block over here. That's an average endogenous period. Sorry, 24.2. That's an average endogenous period. This would be somebody who's more a night person. This would be somebody who's more an early morning person. But exposed to traveling across either east-west in the north, uh, east-west in the south, when it's more dark, that's when it's more light, and then traveling northwest back and forth and southwest back and forth north. And essentially, really, what I want to show you here for these different groups of people with inherent uh, endogenous uh, uh, time clocks, the adaptation time, the modeled adaptation time to these different exposures is very variable. And really, it comes down to the fact that maybe, and this has to be uh, still um, studied in a um, real-life pragmatic setting, experimental setting, but it is possible that north-south travel is also associated with an element of jet lag, probably most minimal when we travel around July, when the sun in the north and the south are not that different, amount of daylight hours, compared to when we travel in either winter or summer, midwinter, midsummer in the north and south. So that's just a new frontier for thought. What are the factors now to, and I'm going to now go and talk a little bit about the practicalities of how we deal with this, the factors that will affect the return of your time, uh, endogenous time cues and its rhythms back to normal. We call it the resynchronization period. So there are about six or seven main, main groups. The first is the number of time zones crossed. And of course, we now know the bigger the number, the longer the time. I've given you the rule of thumb already. But I've highlighted that perhaps north-south is not a uh, situation which excludes you from having a disruption of your uh, time, uh, your normal circadian rhythms. We spoke uh, about the direction of flight. Uh, we know that in most cases, east-west, um, the time to adjust is 35, 30 to 50% less if it's from east to west. It's easier for most people compared to west-east, uh, that so-called phase delay and phase advance. And this is because uh, of the uh, natural rhythm of the body being about 24.2 hours. In other words, um, there's a uh, phase advance. Okay, the next factor is age. Um, older age is associated with a change in the normal sleeping patterns. Uh, it usually uh, uh, is, involves going to bed um, earlier and rising earlier over time. And therefore, older athletes would perhaps favor an adjustment from west to east uh, travel. 
Um, the exposure to environmental cues, I've already indicated that, that sunlight is the most important uh, uh, stimulus. Uh, when we talk about the practicalities in a moment, exposure to certain types of artificial light, even uh, lights uh, that is um, emitted and exposed when you are wearing devices, we'll speak a little bit about that. And then other factors we've mentioned, meals, exercise, etc., and pharmacological agents. I think for me the key, uh, and again perhaps this relates to the new frontier component, is the fact that most um, advice we give to a traveling team is based on the entire team. And I liked uh, the talk just before which spoke about the levels of monitoring, and in this case it will probably come down to a refinement of the individual differences. So we had the, roughly the three groups in this audience, and the understanding is probably that the plan, the uh, resynchronization plan for your team needs to be tailor-made to these different groups of athletes. And I'll speak a little bit about that uh, again on Sunday with some early data. So the factors, just uh, from a clinical pearls point of view, to factors that affect our ability to adapt. We spoke about most of these, but we call them major factors. There's time zones, sunlight, direction, age, and individual variation. And then other factors, uh, diet, nutrition, drugs and medication, the so-called chronobiotic drug, drugs, and then possible seasonal differences in daylight duration uh, when we travel north to south. I'm not going to speak too much, in fact, not at all really, about pharmacological agents. These have been reviewed very extensively recently. Um, and except to say that this is another new frontier, perhaps, um, but more uh, a frontier of understanding how medication would interfere with that genetic or uh, control of these different time uh, uh, you know, determinants of cycles. But essentially, two types of drugs, those that act as external cues and then facilitators, and then those that have, a, uh, uh, have an intensifying effect on the normal external cues. And the most important one is probably melatonin. So jet lag and sports performance, again, time doesn't allow me to go into a lot of detail. Essentially, most, uh, in summary, if you like, there's some really good publications, some come from from, from, from this very uh, institution. Um, and the bottom line, perhaps, if I had to try and summarize, is that there's quite a lot of anecdotal but less scientific evidence. But overall, you uh, have a reduction in, in, in performance, in athletic performance. It's quite sports specific, probably, as well. Um, uh, with jet lag, the more the desynchronization, the greater the decrease in performance. Um, and East travel has a greater detrimental effect. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, just uh, the event taking place this evening, uh, the ability to sprint, max maximal sprint and intermittent sprint performance is reduced after East travel. And so it'd be interesting to see what athletes and coaches and teams have done in order to prepare for tonight about that. All right, I'm going to uh, really finish off uh, just with uh, the rest of the clinical pearls. Again, I am going to uh, invite you to come and discuss this in the workshop tomorrow. We'll explore all these different components. These are just very practical um, lists of, of uh, measures to consider. Um, any uh, time zone shift, even if it's small, it would be useful to schedule competitions um, and if that's possible most of the time it's not but certainly training can be scheduled uh, based on the direction of travel um, for instance uh, competitions or uh, training in the morning after a westward flight in the evening of the eastward flight um, if in the case of for instance the super rugby tournament in south africa they normally or we normally get our teams to travel sequentially they go from South Africa to Perth on the west part of Australia, down to Brisbane and then to New Zealand. That would be the most uh, optimal way of doing it uh, and not the other way around, travel to New Zealand and then go, come back. Um, I'll speak a little bit about pre-setting sleep-wake cycles and meals, but avoiding alcohol uh, during the flight is, um, is a key factor. 
the general uh, guidelines, if you like, with respect to a really long haul travel. Um, and again, it would be a question of arriving at a suitable time to allow for adaptation. If you're traveling halfway across the world, it's probably better to take a west-east flight than an east-west flight for most people. It may not, in fact, be the case, uh, you know, depending on whether you're an early morning person or a late evening person. Uh, you can synchronize and start a few days before with the way you would prepare by sleeping earlier. So if you're anticipating an east-west flight, go to bed later, west-east flight going to bed earlier. Um, exercise session is a good thing immediately after. It has two important effects. The effects of exercise itself to restore cycle and exposure to sunlight. Um, to maintain and uh, adopt the sleeping patterns and the meal patterns of the arrival or the destination. Uh, I spoke about alcohol. One of the things, and I'll speak a little bit about this on Sunday, is to try and get an idea as to whether or not your athletes are in fact the uh, larks or the owls or where they are in between. And you can do it the way I did it, which is just asking everybody. But there are some useful tools. And uh, we've, adopted, we've used one of those tools, a validated questionnaire called a Horner Erstberg Morning Evening Personality Questionnaire. And a little bit like um, uh, doing a variety of different questionnaires as part of your pre-season or periodic health assessment, perhaps this is a useful thing to understand and know in those athletes where you anticipate a lot of traveling. And then light exposure is another key aspect. Natural light is best, um, but there are a variety of devices. There's some studies and research being done and showing that they do affect the internal body clocks. For instance, transcranial bright light devices in your ear that you can use. I want to speak a little bit about uh, just use of drugs, mostly on melatonin. Most of the time when I give a talk like this, everybody wants to know what do I do with melatonin? Well, it's probably the most researched drug. There's some uh, systematic reviews, meta-analysis on it. And essentially, uh, if I had to try and give it to you in a nutshell, there's individual variation, as we know. But if you travel west to east, uh, then on the day of your travel to the east, uh, then take a dose at the ideal bedtime in the destination zone. So in other words, you would probably take it much earlier because you'd say it's, not, you know, when you're currently in South Africa and you're going to Australia, which is maybe six hours difference, I would take it at two o'clock in the afternoon. And I'll try to uh, use the melatonin, uh, which is one of the key elements to, uh, uh, you know, to measure your body clock by, I would take melatonin. Then after arrival, then you just take it at bedtime, bedtime again. East to west, it's less useful, but you can take it on arrival at the normal arrival bedtime time. And a useful tip is perhaps sometimes that if you wake up early, if I go to the US, I wake up classically at, uh, at uh, one o'clock in the morning, bright, and I want to be ready to work. And the answer at that point is you can take uh, another dose of melatonin and it may be beneficial to resetting that body clock. Hypnotics, uh, for those of you who are sports physicians, they have a place to enable sleep. Um, but they do not, sorry, uh, apologies for this uh, spelling mistake, do not uh, address the desynchrony. They don't change the body clock at all. Um, and the side effects are there. You can get this hangover effect, which you don't want on the day of performance. And so therefore you choose one of the shorter acting hypnotics rather. Stimulants, uh, I measured social drugs. Caffeine is one. And uh, even a single dose at night can even delay the circadian rhythms. Uh, but you can use it uh, to maintain some, maintain some uh, daytime alertness uh, when you are traveling. There are lots of uh, speculation and probably lots of research on future drug use, melatonin antagonists. And again, I think the future is a direct manipulation of the molecular signature of your central uh, time uh, uh, clock genes is probably where the future lies.
a few words on illness risk and traveling. Martin, I'm going to tackle I'm this most. Sorry, I'm just going to draw you to a close because we actually have run over time and we're running right into the break. Okay. I, I don't want to interrupt. But no, no, no that's maybe, this is I know a, we've got three more great sessions that are coming down the track with you. Absolutely. So, so no problem with that. I, uh, this is, in fact, my last slide. Sure. I am going to uh, deal with the majority of the illness related issues uh, on Sunday at, um, at the present on, presentation on Sunday afternoon. So let me close there and uh, thank you very much for your attention.